Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. We appreciate your patience while we get all the audio and video set up. My name is Eric Rosbro. I am Associate Librarian and Senior Cataloger at the McCracken Research Library. And the McCracken Research Library is proud to present today another installment of our local lore events with Bob Richard. We're also... We're also very proud today, you may have seen all the fancier audio-visual equipment toward the back of the room. We're very proud to present C-SPAN is filming this today, so when you get home, you can not only watch this on the Center of the West YouTube channel, you'll be able to watch it on C-SPAN. You can watch them both and compare. All you people out there in C-SPAN, our next talk will be August 18th, and it will be called The Most Scenic 75 Miles. You're going to want to come out to Cody and catch that event here at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West in Cody, Wyoming. Anyway, this talk has a very interesting genesis uh, to me. Two of the earliest families in the area are the Frost and Richard family. The Frost family had a, a ranch outside of town, and one summer... A photographer came for the summer and he had all this equipment, he had plates, he had photographer, he had all these cameras and he left them at the end of the summer and so a 20 year old Ned Frost took all this equipment and at that point was not just a hunting guide and trip leader to Yellowstone, he also became a photographer and uh, Jack Richard, the son of Ned's partner Fred, became an esteemed photographer. So photography kind of runs in these two families and you have these families which are really into this rugged outdoor existence but also going in a very creative uh, direction. And so Bob uh, is the son of Jack Richard and he's going to be telling us a little bit about the photography work of these two guys and maybe others for all I know. I'd also like to mention the help of Mac Frost here. Mac Frost is also a photographer and my coworker. I just yanked the mic off from the C-SPAN mic, sorry. Anyway, Bob, if you don't know, has deep roots in Wyoming soil. He commenced his hunting guide career at the age of 10. He was a U.S. Marine Corps helicopter pilot. He was a swim coach, a rancher. He worked for the American Red Cross. More pertinent to our events today, he was a horseback Yellowstone guide in, Yellow, in Yellowstone National Park. That was one of his first jobs. But I know you didn't come here to hear me. You came here to hear the man, and that's why I'm going to give you Bob Richard. Thank you all for coming. Uh, what a treat for me to share with you and trying to put Yellowstone Park 150 years in 45 minutes is really tough. And I looked at lots of Ned Frost photographs, F.J. Haynes photographs, uh, Jack Richard, Fred Richard photographs, some of my own, and I have mixed in my love of Yellowstone, my, I call it my backyard. Granddad would let me uh, drive the pickup at the age of 10 to Yellowstone as long as I remembered all the streams, all the mountains, and all the rock formations. And if I missed one, then he lit up a big black cigar, and it was a gagger, and I had to sit between he and my grandmother when we went to Yellowstone. So I learned quickly. I didn't know why. Uh, these are some of the people and where we've gotten the photographs that are in today's presentation. That uh, encompasses 150 years. Uh, this is a photograph that Dad took of me uh, at Artist Point. And uh, I had just gone into the Marine Corps and had come back on leave. And it came to my mind, Ned Frost and Fred Richard and the family, five generations have been in Yellowstone for 138 years. That's quite a bit of time. 
This is Old Faithful. It's one of my favorite photographs that I've taken. Mammoth Hot Springs, the uh, Travertine Terraces, uh, the springs, and they change every year. With all the earthquakes, it changes constantly. Uh, it changes the plumbing. And every spring, I will go to Yellowstone and see what's changed because of earthquakes. That's taken of the lower falls. They're uh, 308 feet high. This is an interesting photograph. My dad took this in 1957, the black and white. And you can see uh, off to the right hand corner, the Old Faithful, or not Old Faithful, the Canyon uh, Hotel before it burned down. Then I flew over it in about 2006 and flew fairly close to where Dad was and photographed the same image. So you see what it was uh, back in the 50s and what it is today. Oh, these are always in the pictures up until the 70s. And then those are begging cubs. And then somebody's inspecting a camera. And of course, uh, lots of things can happen and they're told they're dangerous, but people didn't believe it. Now they don't believe, I call it the Disney syndrome. Let me walk up next to the buffalo and take my picture or next to the bear. It's always been a problem. This is a black bear. How did I get this close? I rolled down my window and took the picture. I did not get out of my car. Uh, this is called King of the Road. Uh, big grizzly, look at the claws on his front feet. Uh, this is on Sylvan Pass. And my guests that were with me when I was on tour says, oh, let him get on the car. I said, sure, and about that time a pickup came by and the bear jumped in the back of the pickup and the guy starts driving faster and the bear says, I don't like this and bailed out, but we got some good pictures. But it's one of my favorite photographs. This is bear 109 that was killed in a car accident up by Pahaska and is up as you come in the front door has been mounted and she's there. She raised a lot of cubs and her cubs are now full grown and living on the North Fork. These are two of the books by Aubrey Haynes that I use as resource books. And uh, I'm always looking for answers. Every time I go to Yellowstone, I learn more and I've been going there a long time. Uh, this is another book uh, and I have these some of these books up here, you can, you're can you welcome to look at them. Please leave them because they're my resource books. Uh, but it helps me find answers quickly. I don't tell guests when I take them to Yellowstone some story. I said, let's look them up and get the right answer. And they appreciate it. We've had Native Americans living for over 11,000 years in Yellowstone. Usually they leave in the wintertime, but we did have uh, some that wintered there around the hot springs. This is Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce that went through in 1877 with a couple of thousand horses, or not thousand, I'm sorry, it was over a thousand horses and 700 people. They lived off the land from the Washington, all the way through Idaho, through here, and then turned north and stopped just shy of the Canadian border. And fresh troops from North Dakota came over, had a battle, and Chief Joseph put down his arms and said, I will fight no more. Jim Bridger came through here in the uh, 1820s and reported, and other people reported on Yellowstone most people didn't believe what they saw or what they told. The next are surveyors that came through. They were surveying for railroads, hotels. Miners were basically 
looking all over the park, but also Cook City. Market hunters came in and harvested game in the summertime. Sport hunters came in, early day hunting. Uh, they didn't have anybody to be game wardens or keepers. Soldiers were finally brought in because of Buffalo Bill and uh, General Sheridan got together and said, we need to stop this activity. And so the soldiers came in and were uh, in Yellowstone between 1886 and 1918 when the Department of Interior took over. Uh, Rangers have always been there since 1918 and they've had naturalists, they've had law enforcement or protection service uh, and all types of Rangers. Most of us when we were Rangers in the park uh, wore all the hats. If we were short people in the gates, we went down and had to take money and charge people. Uh, I hated that because I had to balance the books at the end of each day, and if I was short, it came out of my pocket. So I was very careful, and sometimes we got people that would say, I gave you a 20, and I knew they gave me a $10 because I put it under a rock in front of me till I made change. But you learn those things. Uh, this is up at Mammoth, and that's Liberty Cap, but over the left corner is Fort Yellowstone, and that's where the superintendents lived, and the soldiers came in, and that was the original Fort Yellowstone when uh, General Sheridan got soldiers to take over and manage Yellowstone. We had Civilian Conservation Corps, CCCs. We had six camps in Yellowstone Park in the 30s. They helped make trails, bridges, and their work still exists throughout the park. Uh, this is mixing cement. The snow is there at Mammoth. But again, till World War II, they were an integral part of helping Yellowstone build trails and, and make backcountry accessible. They fought forest fires, that type of thing. I came along in the 50s, 1956, and uh, Lon Garrison was the superintendent. He had come from Yosemite and said, I want a front country ranger talking with people and helping them uh, with issues like letting their uh, water out of their trailer run on the ground and to get them to put buckets under it and correct issues. He says, I don't want you to write a lot of tickets. Just make them feel at home and correct the problems. In six years of working there, I issued six tickets and they were serious ones. But I enjoyed the job of visiting with people and Lon Garrison did too. Every other week he would say, Bob, I'm gonna meet you at Old Faithful or Canyon. I was stationed at Lake and I had to bring my horse and another horse because Lon insisted on riding my saddle, my horse, Big Red. And as we we're riding through the campgrounds or around Old Faithful, busy with people, he'd look at me when we had a chance. He says, you've got the best job in the park. And I agreed with him. Uh, this is Big Red between us. And uh, I hated to leave the Park Service, but I was offered a commission uh, to fly in the military. And I turned my commission back to the Park Service and went off and spent a lot of years flying. Today, here's three young rangers. Uh, Brad, Mike, and I'm not remembering the other brother because he was stuck over in Beckler. They were all... Uh, rangers that ran different parts of the park, and they're all retired today. But they had the attitude of helping people. And this is taken in the, by the fireplace at uh, the Lake Ranger Station. This man is Cam Shawley. He was raised uh, at Mammoth and uh, Gardner. He is our superintendent of the park, and 
He has the right stuff. He's the right leader. He, I was up over the 4th of July, talked to the rangers that were walking around and helping people as naturalists, and talked to some of the maintenance people, and they all said, wow, he is taking care of us, helping get us better housing, and he is really working hard to get this park back open. And I think he's doing a great job. I've been up there about three times, and what I see, we're gonna see more roads open very soon. This is Suzanne Lewis. She was the only woman superintendent for Yellowstone. And she came from Pensacola, Florida. And when I met her, she looked at me and says, I've heard all about you, Bob. You're a naval aviator. And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, I, you just bear with me. She says, I've learned to handle you guys. And we got along fine. But I, every superintendent over the years, I sent him a letter at the end of the season with the things I see that are good and wrong that need to be corrected. And believe it or not, several of them invited me to their retirements and they went through their letter on the screen and said I've taken care of every one of these. But if something's wrong, it should be corrected. This is Craig Thomas. I went to school with him in the Wapita School. Uh, became our U.S. Senator. He's now deceased but he was opening the uh, center at Canyon, a visitor center. This is Bob Smith. He's with the University of Utah. He went to work in Yellowstone the same time I did. He went up 76 different streams out of Yellowstone Lake by himself with a backpack for a week and checking trout and uh, doing it for fisheries. And then he went on, finished his degrees. He flew in the Air Force, and I forgave him for that. But uh, anyway, uh, we're still friends. He has a home between Moose and the airport in Jackson. And he is the man that has gotten all the seismic sites in, uh, GPS sites, and his team from the University of Utah studies all movement in the park, both vertically and shifting faults, that type thing. And I've done pack trips with Bob and John Lonsbury, who was a district uh, ranger at Lake. And every summer we would do a different uh, pack trip in the different parts of the park. And we'd take the oldest ranger that had retired that could ride a horse and take them along with us and get them to share their stories when they were a ranger. Uh, one of them uh, would go to sleep on his horse and he'd start to lean one way and the horse would move over. And uh, I finally said, John, we gotta stop, gotta get this guy awake. And But we did 10 days staying in uh, some of the backcountry cabins. What an experience to be with all these people that love Yellowstone like I do. This is Soda Butte, uh, and there was a ranger station there. And today you drive by, you don't see any part of that except for the Soda Butte and the spring that runs out the side of it. And you're looking up Soda Butte Creek. This is Larry Larum in front with his guests from Valley Ranch. And this was uh, probably in the 30s, uh, early 30s, and uh, Horace Albright, the superintendent, is riding out of Mammoth with his group. This is early day transportation in the park. There is a display on Yellowstone, 150 years right down the hall, uh, and take time to go down and see it. This uh, wagon, is one of the original wagons and is displayed there. Here is uh, eight horses teamed up pulling three wagons in front of uh, Old Faithful Inn. This is Frost and Richard with one of the carriages that they used to take people to Yellowstone for 18 days, self-contained, up to 150 guests at a time 
They borrowed every wagon, every horse, and every man that could drive a wagon to help them do these trips. Pretty amazing. This is a camp right above the Chittenden Bridge on the, the upper falls of the Yellowstone. And they would camp here and walk the North Rim and the South Rim and spend three nights there. And uh, this is the photograph that really rang a bell with me. People each had their own stools, but they had breakfast and dinner and they had a lunch to carry every day. And those cooks must have been pretty busy. Once in a while, and Granddad caught this photograph for my Uncle Ned of Cook, whose name was Jonesy, Phonograph Jones, feeding the bears back in the early 1900. Can you believe that? That's terrible. I'll, I'll tell you more, but I met my wife up there feeding the bears and I arrested her. And I gave her the choice of going to dinner or uh, going to court. And she says, well, I'm not stupid. And uh, that was halfway through my career in the Park Service. And we got married. We had two children in Yellowstone before we went to the Marine Corps. But lots of stories. This is one of the cook wagons on the 30th of June trying to get over Sylvan Pass. There's a wagon. My granddad is bailing off of it. I think Uncle Ned took the picture. Uh, and they had to unpack that whole thing and put it back together. And that's going through Dunraven Pass. Uh, I mean, this is, I can't imagine having to drive horses or ride horses uh, for 18 days to do the upper and lower loops. This is the corkscrew uh, and Frost and Richard taking guests both by wagon and horseback. In 1919, they replaced that with a dirt, rock, and concrete uh, corkscrew that they used till 1927. This is an interesting photograph. Granddad is taking 18 school teachers from Chicago and next to him sits the future Mrs. Richard. Uh, granddad had a broken shoulder and it was, uh, he couldn't handle the reins very well so this lady said, I'll handle the ribbons. And she drove a school teacher the 18 days. And when they stopped back at Lake Hotel, Granddad asked her to marry him and went back to Chicago and brought back his bride to Cody. And that became my grandmother. How about this? Uh, this is coming through Sylvan Pass around the 1st of July, uh, 1916. They cleared it for horses, but the cars still weren't getting through. This was in 1916. This is the Sylvan Lake Hotel. Most people don't know it ever existed. And they tore it down in 1926. But this was a stopping place for the buses after the wagons were stopped in 1916. This is Mount Washburn with a couple of the carriages and guests of Frost and Richard. Buffalo Bill at Pahaska and promoting the East Gate and getting people to come to Cody. And he'd gotten a train in across the river. And it was very important to him that Yellowstone was a destination point and uh, all the different railroads tried to get a destination point around Yellowstone and bring people to Yellowstone. This is up by Gardner, and people were loading, and supplies were being loaded at Gardner to go into the park. Here's uh, a camp at Old Faithful on the left, tent camp, and the center photograph is one of the first buildings at uh, Mammoth, and then on the right is the Baronet Toll Bridge. 
And I still take people down and show them the bridge abutments that are there. It's just below the Yellowstone uh, Bridge across the Yellowstone at Tower. Uh, this again is showing uh, some of the Concord coaches. This is a current coach that has been rebuilt and is used to take people to Paradise Glen and uh, really give today's people an opportunity for a cookout, a little cowboy music, and ride coaches. They also have wagons. This is one of Ned Frost's. He was selling Studebaker cars and he also sold uh, automobile uh, bus transportation. And this is here in the museum. That's the taxi after the horse and wagons were put away that drove between here and the Burlington Cody Inn across the way to bring people to the Irma. And it's here in the museum down the hall. This is Horace Albright on August 1st, 1915, opening the East Gate to cars. And there they are. Now here they're trying to get a vehicle through Sylvan Pass. You can see the rocks that are mixed up with the snow. It wasn't easy even with cars in the early days. This is the East Gate as I knew it. And once in a while, I had to go down and, and open it up and, uh, till we got our seasonals in to uh, uh, take the cars and take their money and give them a ticket or a pass. Uh, this is that young lady that I arrested earlier. And after we were married, uh, my boss picked her up one day and uh, she was feeding oranges to the black bear. And he says, June, you can't do that. She says, well, when your wife stops it, I'll stop it. <laughs> he came back and chewed on me. It was all my fault. And we have bus transportation, buses that carry up to 55 people. Uh, this is at uh, Grant Village. And lots and lots of good improvements. The park is cleaner than I've ever seen it. And uh, anybody that goes there is going to love it and enjoy it. Uh, this is a map showing the highlights when I was doing tours for over 40 years in Yellowstone. That I, if I had people for one day, I would do a lower loop or an upper loop. If I had them for a week, uh, we spent more time visiting different things. I had people from India, and they brought their 25-year-old daughter, and she had a list of 110 things she wanted to see in Yellowstone. I looked at her list, and I didn't even recognize some of the names. I says, oh, yeah, we can handle it all. And at the end of the five days, she said, you got all of them but one. And I says, I think you missed marking that down. Anyway, I was happy to see them leave, and they were happy. They enjoyed the trip. This is Jim McCaleb. He was the vice president for Zantera and ran the hotels, that type of thing in the park, and not only here, but throughout the West. And he has just retired a couple of years ago, but cared about his employees, cared about providing good services and good food to the people that visited Yellowstone. This is Fishing Bridge. Fishing Bridge has been there uh, since the 30s, and it's starting to show a lot of wear. They worked on it and worked on the abutments, and they tell me that we've got nine more years before it's going to collapse. And I keep saying, we need to have you get it in the system, and let's rebuild another bridge and save this for people just to walk across. Big problem, ice builds up when it's coming out in the spring and builds up, 
and the rangers have to even use dynamite to break up the ice so it doesn't take the bridge out. Speaking of ice, this is before the river froze. And look on the left side and you'll see uh, the boat dock. My favorite place in the summertime, I'd borrow a rowboat and take June and at that time one of the boys, put life jackets on them and a fly fish, catch a dozen trout, turn them loose, all cutthroat. I'd keep one, fillet it, and we'd have it for dinner. My mother called it Yellowstone bacon, but really tasty. This is the oldest hotel in the park, Lake Hotel, great place for dinner. Uh, when my wife was alive, we loved to go there the last two or three days of the season and tour the park and come back, have a nice dinner, and then go back out in the Hayden Valley and see the animals. What a treat. This is the front of Lake Hotel, taken from out in the lake, and all those boats belong to people from Cody, Paul Stock, Husky Oil, and others. And then right in the center is the uh, building that served the boat dock. And that is an earlier picture taken in the 30s. But that was there till they moved it to Bridge Bay. This is out on the lake, Yellowstone Lake in the 50s. And that was the last time any snow planes were on the lake because as I was going across driving one of them at 70 miles an hour, uh, really skimming along, all of a sudden all I saw was blue water in front of me. And I had binoculars hanging on me, heavy coat, heavy snow pants, and I added the throttle. It's an 85 horse engine on the back with a pusher type prop. And I skimmed across this open water, and I went on out and swung around to warn the other two. They never saw it. And I said, we're not taking any more snow planes or anything on this lake. And they never did after that. But it was a great trip, and you can see Lake Hotel in the background. These are the ski patrol cabins in the backcountry. <clears throat> Couldn't get in through the door. The snow was up to the eaves of the roof, and there was always a big scoop shovel, and you dug down to a identified window that was unlocked and let yourself in. You had wood inside, started fire, and food down underneath in a sub area, and uh, you, you know, always carried when you were snowshoeing or skiing a bedroll on your back and food enough to get you through a night if you couldn't get from one patrol cabin to the other. They're still there, they're still used. This is where I was uh, stationed as a young ranger. I had to do paperwork, I hated it. I'd much rather be on the horse doing horse patrol or road patrol or uh, campground patrol or going out on a boat checking fishermen. Of course, the limit was 10 trout in those days, and nobody ever took more than they needed anyway, except some relatives that came up to visit with my mother and her brothers and sisters, and, and the next thing I saw is they had too many trout, and I said, that's it. You're out of here. And so they left, and the big problem was is my uncle on his way back to Cody, his kids all in the back of the pickup and their camper was stopped on Mary Bay doing 60 miles an hour. And my boss stopped him and he got it, my uncle got out of the truck and put his hands on his hips. Do you know that my nephew is the superintendent of the park? <laughs> my, my boss said, I really had trouble keeping a straight face. <laughs> anyway, he chewed on him a little bit wrote on the back of his pass that if he got to Eastgate before a certain time, they would arrest him and take him to Mammoth with all his kids. Anyway, uh, one of my mother's brothers, and I never enjoyed hearing that story more than when I told it to him afterwards. This is Brad Ross. He His last job was 
uh, the manager of all the backcountry. And he had different districts. And he was going to retire as the district ranger for Lake. And in the Lake Ranger Station are about 25 photographs, enlargements, of my dad's. And you can go to the Lake Ranger Station, knock on the door, get somebody to come, let you in, and you can visit and look at the early day photographs taken by dad, Ned Frost, showing the history of the lake area. And by, over Brad's shoulder is when I was a horse ranger in front of Lake Hotel. This is a fish hatchery that existed for a long time there, and it's still there, but it's not being used. This is the storage area uh, for boats, and it's still there. And then you have West Thumb, and there used to be a boat dock here. This is the fishing cone, and this is one of the hot springs in the area with a forest fire in the background. Uh, this is an old faithful hotel in 1895 to 96, and today's current hotel that was built in 1904. Uh, a fireplace inside has eight fireplaces, uh, one on each corner and big fireplaces in the center. The earthquake in 59 toppled the chimney, and only three of these fireplaces work today. This is one of the uh, curly pieces of wood that's attached to the fireplace. And I found where it's written uh, 1904, and it's still there. It says you're going into the dining room. People are gathered around Old Faithful. It's a collection point, and people stay once or twice. You can call it up on an app and know when it's roughly going to go off. When I was there, it went every 60, 62 minutes. Now it's an hour and a half, sometimes longer. Hamilton Stores existed for years and years. It's now been taken over by another company, but they had a great reputation, and they're the only ones that serve Wilcoxon's ice cream and have since the 20s. And uh, so always keep that in mind. Uh, this is Norris, and that's the Norris Hotel that was right to open the door. Somebody started a fire. This was the fourth hotel, and it, when they started a fire in the fireplace, they hadn't worked it out right, and that hotel burned down. So four hotels burned down at Norris. This is one of the earlier hotels. This is the Visitor Center. It's called the Albright Center. It was the headquarters for the soldiers. This was a, in Mammoth, and it was a specimen house where they took horseshoes and other things, threw them into a hot spring, and the calcium formed on the horseshoes, and then they sold them to the tourists. Of course, they decided that wasn't right and stopped it. These are petrified redwood trees up on Specimen Ridge. And uh, my son Scott hiked up there, took uh, the Appalachian Mountain August Camp people up there. And he had a different group every week. And this was one of the day hikes. But uh, these trees are up into the Lamar, and you can see them in many places. This is the Toll Bridge again. Soda Butte, and these buffalo are waiting for the tourists. It's amazing. And I always tell my guests uh, when they'd see the buffalo right by the road, I says, they have to watch tourists. That's what they do in the summer. And they'd look at me and frown. And I had fun with this. When Suzanne Lewis was the superintendent, I showed this at one of the Cody meetings, and I said, Suzanne, why does this, the only vault toilet in the park that has its own mailbox? And she looked at her staff and says, well, staff, 
tell me about it. Well, he didn't know either. And so I explained that this was the mailbox for the Silvertip Ranch just north on Slough Creek. And he came down every day on horseback and got their mail. Now, Cam Sholly didn't like that. And I don't know who moved it, but the mailbox is no longer there. This is where the tectonic plate slid from, which is at the northeast gate, down and landed on Hart Mountain. And you can stop there by the warm springs and look both north and to the south and see where it broke loose and slid 60 miles down to Hart Mountain. Uh, nobody tells you that, but it's there. And if you get three geologists talking about it, they all argue whether it really happened or not. But uh, anyway, Hart Mountain has younger uh, limestone on top of older limestone, and it's because that plate slid down here. This is the Canyon Hotel before it burned down. Oh, I hit the wrong button, and Mac has to take care of me. I hope. <laughs> wow. Well moved. Not my fault. <laughs> wow. Canyon, Canyon Hotel burned while I was on duty in uh, 1960, 11 o'clock at night. And you could see the fire burning uh, from Lake. And uh, it had been condemned and uh, all the bathtubs had been sold here in Cody and all the pipe and all the valuable stuff. And uh, anyway, uh, one of the really beautiful hotels in the park. Okay, uh, we're now at, thank you, Mac. Sorry about that. <laughs> this is the Upper Falls that's 90 feet high. This is a tree that was carved by the Hayden Party in 1871, just above the Upper Falls. Uh, I learned about it from my grandfather. I showed it to uh, some of the rangers. The superintendent wanted to know where it was, and he said, will you take me there? And I never got around to it because I was afraid he'd cut it and put it in, in his museum. It's still growing there. This is... Uh, the lower falls, 308 feet, uh, beautiful spot. This is the Mud Geyser Soldier Station. This is Big Red and I crossing Fishing Bridge. Never got caught by a lure, but we visited with everybody as we crossed. They also spent in the 60s capturing elk, there were too many, and shipped them to all the states that wanted elk. And we have elk from Yellowstone Park in a dozen states around the country today, including Pennsylvania. This is the corral that they were run into, loaded up into trucks after they cut the horns off and shipped them elsewhere. This is one of the early day snow coaches they're still in use uh, today. And this 
is a Hiller 12E that I rented in Grable, came home on leave, picked my granddad up on Logan Creek, that Cedar Mountain behind it, and I flew him around Yellowstone and the Shoshone Forest for two and a half hours, brought him back and landed, and uh, he looked at me and says, Bobby, you showed me in two and a half hours what took me a lifetime to do on horseback. It was one of the neatest days for me to share that with my granddad. This is a special photograph for many reasons. This is Max's photograph. That's Heart Mountain. And when I, from the time I was a kid, that is the weather vane. I look at the clouds. I know what the weather's going to be. But every time I came back to Cody all my life, I knew I was home. This is the landmark for we that live in Cody, Wyoming. And it's Heart Mountain. And it was on the, all the early day maps. It was named Buffalo Heart by the Native Americans. Uh, Heart Mountain, yeah, and I always kid and say, gee, you must have been from Powell to spell it wrong. But... Uh, uh, Yellowstone Regional Airport, the old Cody Trading Company before it burned and they rebuilt it. Our fire department, there's a new book out on the fire department. First rodeo grounds were right out front here, uh, between here and where the uh, uh, Cody High School football field is. And then on the right, you can see the old red schoolhouse. And the bell tower, there, they took the bell out of it and it's at Sunset School. They didn't know where it came from till I told them I used to pull the rope on that rascal. Uh, the Hidden Side of Yellowstone. This is a book at Sunlight Sports on hiking trails both in the Shoshone Forest as well as uh, Yellowstone. South Gate. This was back in the 50s. That's the headquarters there. This is the uh, Roosevelt Arch, North Gate, Northeast Gate. General Phil Sheridan and his involvement. I took this a few weeks ago. That's Mount Sheridan and the ice going out. And we were driving along and I was helping people learn about Yellowstone, and I snapped that through the window, and kind of like it. Uh, Buffalo Bill, when he was involved in helping uh, General Sheridan get the soldiers uh, there. Now, Mac, you have to talk about this one. Okay. This is the 4th of July this year, and th that's the uh, fireworks display that uh, was going on uh, across the river from the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. And this is a, a picture that I had been, been planning to take for many, many years, uh, just to put the uh, fireworks behind the statue of the scout by Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney. Thank you, Mac. I thought it was a pretty outstanding photograph. Thank you. We have had district rangers train younger rangers as they're learning the ropes. And this hangs in the Lake Ranger Station. And a uh, district ranger by the name of Jerry Mernon uh, always told this to the young men that worked under him. Uh, remember who you are and what you stand for. And it always stood well with all of us. Uh, this is the company that I had for over 40 years. It's now been in existence for 50 years. And if you go back to 1902, Frost and Richard were doing tours and when they could get in the park in 1905 or six, they were doing tours and then had to change over to trucks and cars to take people along with horses. My dad and his brother did horseback tours. Uh, I did a few before I got to the age that I could become a ranger. Uh, this is my first uh, brochure promoting 
the business, and I had a great business, met people from all over the world. And what a treat it was because I learned as much from my guests as they learned from me. This is probably the most, the best picture that I took. And it's the Bears 109 coming into the park. And uh, I've sold over 750 numbered photographs and every retiree that works in the park and for Zantera gets an enlargement that they buy and uh, share with their employees. And not only this is a Ned Frost photograph, do people take pictures? This one was trying to figure out how to run Ned's camera. Uh, I found this and I uh, emailed Teresa Howell and said, could I use this? And if you, can you read it? You can't read it? You can? Good. Anyway, it says Ranger Bob, and I thought, yeah, that's mine. And uh, she said, please go ahead and use it. But, uh, and Scott Moore published the book. Uh, this is a tie pin that I used to wear. This was my uh, Ranger badge when I was a Ranger. Uh, they put this out to celebrate 100 years uh, as a Ranger badge. And then I found this. This is Bill Mundy's tri-motor and uh, taking tours through Yellowstone or over Yellowstone. This is out and for sale in the park right now. This is the resource and issues handbook that is published now when it was first made up it was only for the superintendent of the park. Now you can buy it. This is this year's, it's a collector's item and you can get it at the visitor center. Three natural disasters that I've been involved in, the earthquake, the fires of 88, and the floods. And we've all survived it. It's been tough on the communities and tough on the people. Actually, the earthquake, everybody stayed out of the park and we had great fishing. It was wonderful. Uh, I just, I was always proud to put our flag up outside the ranger station. And this is a thank you to some of the people that helped me put this together. And uh, I, just barely made the time. Uh, I will stay here afterwards for questions, but you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you, and uh, I hope to see you next time.